evening everyone can everyone hear me quite clearly and can everyone see my face and and what i'm sharing on the screen can can everyone just message in the in the chat awesome Good evening everyone can everyone hear me quite clearly and can everyone see my face and and what i'm sharing on the screen can can everyone just message in the in the chat Perfect. Right. So I'm just going to start recording very quickly. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening and uh, welcome to this evening's uh, essential examinations talk on uh, the general pediatrics exam. Um, my name is Stephen and uh, I'm the UIMS Treasurer and Secretary um, and it's with, with great um, pleasure that I can introduce uh, Dr. Jervis um, today who will be talking to us about the, the general paediatrics exam. Um, just to give you a bit of background on, on Dr. Jervis, so um, she's a recent graduate from um, the east of England and uh, she will be starting her job um, as an academic um, foundation doctor with a special interest in in pediatrics um, and uh, and yeah I think she she will be sharing all of her expertise today uh, in teaching us the the A to Z of uh, of a pretty complex exam um, so um, Tish if you wouldn't mind um, just uh, just saying hello um, Hi everyone, thank you very much Stephen for your um, lovely introduction. No, no worries, no worries. Um, so just to let everyone know, uh, we will be recording this lecture um, and uh, we will be uploading this onto our, onto our medal page and our other various um, websites and, and um, platforms that we, we, we stream on and, and we, um, we bank all of our videos. Um, and just to, to quickly talk about the series giveaway, um, I'm sure many of you are now quite well accustomed to uh, the rules of the series giveaway. So um, it's very simple. Basically, after this uh, lecture is over, I will post a feedback form link into the chat, uh, as well as you will see a, a QR code on, on, the final, on the final slide. And if you could fill that out, um, and we will enter you into a random, into a random prize draw um, and the way that our rules work are the more lectures you attend, um, the more times your name will be in our draw, um, therefore increasing your chances of, of getting one of these uh, fantastic prizes. Um, so yeah, please, please do stay till the end um, and please do complete the feedback form. Uh, Medal is a very neat service, which also gives you a very neat certificate um, for your portfolios to, to show your commitments. Um, yeah, in the future as well. So um, yeah, that's the series giveaway. Um, once again, I'd just like to thank all of our sponsors um, and our partners at the bottom. So that's Podcases by Scrubbed In, um, Os Implants, which I'll talk to you um, in, in the next slide. Um, My Suture, who are, who are kindly um, donating a, 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 a surgical suturing kit for you to practice at home. Uh, Quesmed, um, anastomos, and, and as I mentioned, medal. So yeah, um, one of our partners uh, are OS Education. Um, OS Education is a uh, anatomical resource um, where um, they basically bring augmented reality um, to anatomical models, which they which they print um, for 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 use um, as students, especially in the preclinical years. Um, as you can see in this video, um, in, in, in the video that it's a very neat product um, and it's an incredibly cool, cool way of learning anatomy. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's our introduction done. And I think I can, can stop sharing my screen and Tish, could, could you please share yours? Yeah, of course. Just stop sharing. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay, cool. 
Shall I um, start? Are you happy? Yep, please, please do start. Okay, cool. Um, so thanks guys for joining um, this evening. I'm just gonna go through what we're gonna cover in tonight's talk, um, looking at general paediatrics examinations. Um, so obviously there is quite a lot to cover because PEDS has every system examination, um, but you're just doing it on a child as opposed to an adult. So I'm gonna start with some general tips that hopefully you guys can take away and then apply to other examinations that we don't cover. Um, so today we're gonna to do the neurological examination, cardiovascular, respiratory, and then finish on abdominal examination. Um, I'm gonna try stick to under an hour because otherwise it's just people zone out and there's too much information. Um, so in order to do that, there might be some things, especially in the neuro exam that I more touch on rather than explain in huge amounts of detail. Um, but if there are any questions, if you just wanna put them in the Q and A part of the Zoom, um, and if we've got time, we can hopefully go through them at the end. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Um, feel free to unmute your mic if you feel confident, or if not, just put your answers in the chat and Stephen will kindly read them out to me um, as we go. So we're going to start with a Mentimeter question. So if you guys have a phone or you can do it on your laptop that you're using to watch this, um, if you just go to www.menti.com and then type in the code that's at the top, it will also be in the chat because I'm going to have to go off the screen in a minute just to load it up. Um, and there's also the QR code if that's helpful. Okay. So once you've logged on, if you guys just want to put in what you think or what you find personally are the challenges associated with examining children, just so we can brainstorm a little bit, um, that would be great. Are people are able to log on because I think it's there we go I think you can put up to like three responses in guys so put whatever you feel is important brilliant so even the ones that have come in so far um, are really good I think verbal communication is obviously coming up top which is um the key one because obviously well dependent on the age of the child um especially if they're younger they can't really communicate um and even when they're older they might find it difficult to answer specific questions that perhaps an adult might find a bit easier you've always got parents to deal with um in pediatrics which is one of the most difficult aspects of it and then you've got things like compliance and then you know in an adult examination you can ask them to do certain things in a pediatric examination it's less easy to do so um, so I think you guys have got the kind of main things. So what I'll just do is just pop back onto presentation. There we go. Okay, so these are a few general tips that hopefully you guys can take away and apply um, to any pediatric examination that you do. So first of all, observation is key. As I've already said, and you guys have already brought to light on the other slide, um, obviously kids don't cooperate as easily. They like to be playing, doing their own thing. They don't really like to be tied down on their parents' laps, having their heart listened to, for example. So observation is key. So when you're walking into a room, watching the child play, watching how they walk down the corridor with their parent when you call them into the room, that kind of thing will actually give you loads of information um, for all examinations, but especially things like the neuro examination um, and musculoskeletal examinations. Um, use play and toys when you're examining them um, and remember it's going to have to be a bit opportunistic so structure in a pediatric examination often goes out the window but that is okay because you know you you just have to be willing to adapt to the child and to the scenario as opposed to you know trying to follow your exact structure for example if you're examining a newborn baby and they're 
got their eyes open, looking looking in their eyes and checking for the red reflex is a kind of example of an opportunistic um, way of examining. And then, as I said, leave the distressing parts of the examination till last. So these two boxes are basically how I personally start and how I finish every examination. Obviously, everyone's different um, and you can take from it what you find useful and then adapt it to your own. But I use wiper for the start of an examination. So W is to wash your hands and put on relevant PPE. I is to introduce yourself. P is confirm the patient details. And obviously in pediatrics, you need to know the name and date of birth of the child and who the adult is. Are they parent? Are they uncle, aunt? That kind of thing. Um, explain what you're going to do and then get consent before starting. Um, and then to finish every examination, you obviously want to thank the patient and the parent, readjust the child, screen for any questions, wash your hands, summarise your findings to the examiner and then suggest further investigations. Um, these boxes work quite well, I found, for clinical exams and OSCEs. Um, so I'm not going to include them in the rest of the slides. They're just there to um, refer back to. So we're going to start with the neuro exam. Um, I'm going to try time myself this time so I don't go over time. Um, it might seem a bit fast when we go through, but the key concepts um, I'll make clear so people hopefully don't get confused. So this is a summary um, slide of the exam. So you do your wiper. As most examinations start, you do your general inspection from the end of the bed. I'm going to break this all down for you shortly. Um, then you've then got your cranial nerves, which have to be slightly adapted in children for obvious reasons. Your upper and lower um, nerve examinations, cerebellar function, cognitive assessment, and then your summary and further investigations, which is that second box on the previous slide. So for general inspection, most of this is quite obvious. So as I said, you want to observe them during play. Um, things like handedness and obvious motor deficits will be easy to spot watching a child play. It's quite um, useful. Their attention span, gross and fine motor coordination. So as I said, playing with toys, moving around, interacting with mum, passing parents things, that's really useful to observe. Um, and then problem solving abilities can be tested. Um, but again, you could just watch that during pe uh, play and see how they overcome different things. Just a note for the neuro exam and actually any paediatric exam, you always want to consider the child's age and at what kind of developmental milestones they should be at at that age. Um, because obviously testing things beyond that is not particularly helpful because they won't be able to do it. Um, but then again, picking up children who can't do things that they should be able to do is obviously um, really important. So the cranial nerves, um, in older children, it might be possible to do the full cranial nerve examination. However, um, it obviously depends on the age of the child, their current state and the surrounding environment. So don't be disheartened or worried if you can only test a few cranial nerves um, especially in younger children. It's quite unlikely you'd be able to do a full neuro exam in a child in one sitting. Um, so as I said, for infants, it's mainly observation. I'm just going to go quite quickly through the cranial nerves because this is something that's actually just more useful learning in your own time. Um, but I'm just going to say for each one what you could do with a child in terms of the examination. So for olfactory, it's obviously your smell detection. So you can, for older children, um, ask them to close their eyes and ask them to smell something like chocolate or something that's obvious um, for a child to smell. Um, so yeah, that's cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve two is your acuity visual fields, pupillary reflexes, and then lastly, fundoscopy. So for acuity, if the child's old enough, uh, you can obviously use your Snellen chart. Um, but if they're younger, you can use things like brightly coloured toys and put it in front of their eyes and then watch them follow the toy side to side and up and down. Um, and you can do the same with a visual field. Um, so you want to have something that makes them look in the centre, so something distracting like a toy. And then you can use something else in the periphery to see if when they're looking at the toy, they can still see the toy that you're putting in the periphery, if that makes sense. Um, and then pupil reflexes and fundoscopy on younger kids, you want to leave that till last. It's obviously it will be quite distressing. The same applies for ocular motor, trochlea and abducens. Obviously, it's your eye movements. So you can do that using a toy um, or something that the parents have, like a dummy. Obviously, if it's not too distressing for the child um, and you want to do your 
basic eight shape of the eye movements as much as you can. Um, then you've got your trigeminal nerve. Um, so usually you test sensory and motor function of this. Um, in a child, the motor function, you're basically just going to be feeling their um, masseter muscles. Um, and if they're old enough, you can ask them to clench their jaw. Um, and then sensory, I think I've got um, a question here. Yeah, just before I say it, does anyone, can anyone put in the chat or unmute and say if they want to, the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve that you usually test for um, in sensation of the face? Anyone going for it in the chat, Stephen? Just myself. <laughs> what have you gone for? I've gone for the ophthalmic, the V1, uh, V1 um, axillary and, and mandibular. V2 yeah. and V3. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, as um, Stephen correctly said, these are the three branches that you'd want to test for. So it, it, as this picture shows, are literally just testing sensation to this region, this region and this region. Um, and again, it's difficult on a child because ideally you would ask an adult to close their eyes and then tell them to tell you when they can feel you touching them. Um, but for a child, it may not be possible to test that um, depending on their age. So then I'm just going to whip through these in the interest of time. So these are the remaining um, cranial nerves. So facial nerve. The main thing you want to look for is asymmetry, um, which will be quite obvious in a child um, in a child's face because they're often crying, screaming talking um, and movement, as I said, you can do in older children. So asking them to raise their eyebrows, close their eyes, puff out their cheeks and smile. Then you've got um, vestibular cochlear. So this is mainly balance and hearing. So in older children, you can test this by doing, uh, by whispering in their ear um, and asking them to repeat the number that you whisper. And younger children, you can use things like foil or paper and rustle it in the ear um, and they, if they can hear it will likely turn towards the side that the sound is. Then you've got your glossopharyngeal and vagus, which is easiest in young children, um, looked at by asking them to swallow. So giving them, their mum giving them a bottle or some food um, and seeing, you know, if that's all normal. You can also use a tongue depressor to look at the back of their mouths. Some children might like it depending on their age. They like to say, ah, and others, you know, might reduce them to tears. So just, you know, as I said, be opportunistic and play it by ear. And then accessory nerve is obviously your trapezius and your SCM. Um, so dependent on the age of the child, that might be more difficult to assess. And then lastly, hypoglossal, which in children over sort of one and a half, two is actually quite easy just to ask them to stick their tongue out. Um, so those are cranial nerves. Sorry, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, the key learning point for that was just how to adapt it for children. Um, and just don't be downheartened if you can't get from cranial nerve one to 12 um, in a child. I'm not gonna go through these slides because they're mainly for your own reference, but it's basically just thinking about each cranial nerve and what possible pathologies could affect that nerve. Um, Cause I think it's quite hard when you're actually doing the examination to think about um, pathologies at the same time. So hopefully these next two slides will just be useful for you to go back and cover in your own time. Okay, so moving on to the upper and lower nerve um, part of the neuro exam. So obviously you've got inspection. So you're looking for symmetry, muscle bulk and posture. Children running around um, is quite useful for that. Um, and you can also see, assess their gait at the same time. So these are the kind of things you want to be looking at for gait. Just remember, it's quite normal for a child up to about two or three years old to walk on their tiptoes. Um, so... I think a lot of parents sometimes get worried if it's their first child, they think that their child's, you know, gait is um, abnormal, um, but often that is normal up to two or three. Then you've got tone. Um, can be difficult to assess in a moving mobile child um, because they don't usually relax, um, but you'll be able to assess rough tone um, when you're looking at symmetry and asymmetry, which is the key part. Sensation, again, as I mentioned for the trigeminal nerve, is difficult. We don't tend to use neuro tips on children um, just because they're not that nice. Um, and if the child is old enough to close their eyes, 
um, and tell you when you when they can feel the cotton wool, then that's brilliant and you can test sensation. Muscle strength and power screen, um, most of you will know how to do from doing on an adult. For, for little children who won't be able to follow commands, doing things like passing them a toy when they hold onto the toy, pulling it slightly just to see, you know, what strength they have in their arms. Um, and also with babies and toddlers, getting them to stand, even if they can't stand, just holding them up and they'll sort of kick their legs towards the floor. Um, and it's quite a rough but useful way of assessing muscle strength um, in younger children and babies. And then lastly, your reflexes. So obviously in the newborns, you're going to be testing primitive reflexes like um, suckling reflex and things like that. And then in older children, you'll be doing your usual reflexes that you do in an adult. Um, again, this is more for your reference, but it's basically just how to compare upper and lower motor neuron um, lesions. So looking at the signs that you, um, the signs that you might be able to elicit in your examination and how those vary um, between upper and lower motor neurons um, lesions. So I like to think of upper motor neuron lesions just to avoid confusion as anything to do with the brain and the spinal cord. So they're essentially your central motor neurons and then your lower motor neurons they have their body in the central nervous system, but the rest of their sort of axon um, is in the periphery. So they're more peripheral motor neurons. So essentially your upper motor neuron should synapse with your lower motor neuron, which will then synapse with say your muscle or something like that. Um, so I think understanding that is quite key in order to elicit the different clinical signs. Tish, we just have a quick question. Yeah. So, um... A student, is, a student is asking, when conducting a general physical exam on kids, mm -hmm. um, would you go from head to toe or is it better to start with the hands to build our trust with them and then work towards the head um, and, then, and then the remainder? Mm -hmm. um, very good question. I think head to toe is easier so you don't miss anything in terms of like, you know, confidence. But I think you're right, going straight for the head in a small child is obviously probably gonna be a bit unnerving. So you might want to do things that you can involve them in. So even something like listening to the heart and the lungs, you can give them the stethoscope, they can play with that, that kind of thing and build that trust before you start doing, especially things like ear, nose and throat examinations, um, which most children don't really like. So I think have, have a system in your head, i.e. head to toe, so you don't miss anything, but start with the less kind of invasive things to build trust at the beginning. And I guess it also varies on whether they're crying or whether they're not crying as well. Yeah, exactly. Because if they're crying, you're probably going to not be listening to their chest. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. I think it's difficult because there isn't really an answer because it depends on the child and the situation. Um, so don't worry if your structure slightly goes, I'd say impedes. Um, okay, and cerebellar, I'm just going to go through because I've touched on quite a lot of it. So gait, um, in older children, you can ask them to do the heel to toe walking, which is um, assessment of cerebellar function. Speech is difficult, um, obviously, depending on the developmental stage of the child. If they're old enough, you can ask them to say baby hippopotamus to test um, for cerebellar function for that. And then coordination, obviously, uh, depends on the age of the child. So you've got your finger to nose um, tests like that for coordination and then your heel on your opposite shin um, and again the child has to be old enough to follow commands um, and sort of have an attention span to do that with you and then lastly cognitive which is just very quick so it's again going back to your milestones so checking all the different domains of the milestones and making sure that the child is within those limit ranges of the milestones for their age um, so red flags for milestones are as I mentioned, not being within the limit ages. So I think for walking, most children walk around 12 months, but the limit age is actually 18 months. So if a child doesn't walk until 18 months, that is just a normal variation. Whereas a child not walking until 20 months is a red flag. Um, and then also things like loss of milestones. So they could do something before and now they can't. Um, and yeah. And then there is actually a mini mental state pediatric examination that you can do in children to test cognition and it's usually done from seven years um, and above. So if people want to look at that in their own time, then go for it.
And then lastly, you finish your examination um, by suggesting some further investigations to the examiner. So I've just put a few on here for you guys to think about. So you've got skin assessment. That's mainly just because skin and nervous systems develop from the same part of the embryo. So often if you have um, a problem with your nervous system, it's also going to present in the skin. So things you might look for, like, for example, cafe au lait spots on the skin in something like neurofibromatosis. And then you've got your back assessment kind of linking into that for things like um, spina bifida. And then cardiovascular examination is a good uh, suggestion for any examination. Abdominal examination, measure and plot height and weight on a growth chart is key for the end of any peds examination. Um, and then other things, depending on what you find. So that I think is the neuro exam. Before I go on to cardio, is there any questions on the neuro one? Uh, the chat is completely clear. Okay, cool. Um, so we're gonna go on to cardio now. Um, and again, this is just a summary slide. So we're gonna start with our wiper, um, general inspection. And then for cardio, for most system examinations, um, going back to the question that was asked, I start, and most people do from the hands, go up to the face and then go down the body. Um, I think in kids, head to toe is often used more, um, but learn it in whichever way you find easiest and then remember it because just having a systematic way looks good always. Um, so then you'll measure your JVP, then you'll go onto the face, then the chest, um, lastly check for edema and then your ending which is to summarize and suggest further investigations so just to go through each of those in more detail so the main thing for general inspection in a child is do they look well or do they look unwell do they look lethargic or do they have normal um, sort of levels of alertness are they obviously cyanotic from the end of the bed like this little baby um, are they short of breath or showing increased work of breathing and is there any obvious edema Often in children, key places to look around the eyes um, for any periorbital edema and then also any obvious ascites. So that's an example of some periorbital edema, which is most commonly seen in nephrotic syndrome in kids. Um, and then lastly, syndromic features. Um, so this is a picture of a baby with Down syndrome. Um, so often they have quite a flattened nasal bridge with wide palpable fissures of their eyes. Um, and obviously there are other syndromes that can present with similar features in infancy. So just having a rough awareness of what those features are is quite useful. And then lastly, surrounding medical equipment or medications. So can you see um, any oxygen around the bed, any walking devices or any medications? So particularly in like a cardiovascular examination, if a child's had a heart valve replacement or something like that, um, then you might be looking for like an anticoagulant, warfarin or something, something similar. So then you move on to the hands. Um, and these are just, so I'm going to put up a few images. If people want to unmute or put in the chat what they think they can see in this picture, and then I'll move on to the next one just to practice a bit of data interpretation. It doesn't matter, guys, by the way, if you put the wrong answer, it's all, all part of the learning. OK, so for this one, um, so this is an example of xanthomata, which is something that in a cardiovascular exam you'd want to look at. Um, can be present in the hands. Um, you can also get xanthelasma, which are the same, but around the eyes. And it's basically just cholesterol rich deposits um, that are most commonly seen in familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so obviously that's a key thing to look for in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. Thinking along the same lines of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, does anyone want to say what they can see here in this patient's hands? Elongation of the fingers. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah, exactly. Bang on. So this is arachnodactyly, which is, as Stephen said, the um, spider-like fingers seen in Marfan syndrome. So this is an important thing 
to look for and comment on because um, these patients are prone to aortic and mitral valve prolapses along, as, um, along with aortic dissection. So again, key risk factors. Anyone say what they can see here? <clears throat> clubbing, everyone is saying clubbing. Brilliant, good spot. Um, so that's clubbing when you get loss of the normal angle between the nail and the nail bed. Um, and we'll go through some cardiovascular causes of that soon. Um, and then this one. Are those, is that a septic hemorrhage? Yeah, exactly. So that's splinter hemorrhages. Um, brilliant. Found most commonly in infective endocarditis. Um, and then I'll just give you the last two because they're a bit more difficult. But along the same page of infective endocarditis, you've got your Janeway lesions, um, which are here, and they're usually non-tender and erythematous. And then you've got your Osler's nodes, which you can see on that patient's finger, which are also linked to infective endocarditis. And they are usually tender and a sort of darker purpley brown color, as you can see here. Um, so those are just splinter hemorrhages Janeway's lesions and Osler's nodes are quite good ones to learn for signs of infective endocarditis. Okay, so we've covered most of this through the pictures. So that's what you'll be looking for on inspection. Obviously in an OSCE or a clinical examination, you're not going to be listing off six, seven things. You want to choose a few key um, features and then say whether they're present or not. This is quite useful um, as in sort of vivas, you might be asked for some cardiovascular causes of clubbing. So I use ABC as the three top ones. So you've got an atrial myxoma, which is very rare, but it's basically a tumor of most commonly the left atrium, bacterial endocarditis, as we've already discussed, and then cyanotic congenital heart disease. So for palpation, you want to feel the temperature of the patient's hands. Are they well, you know, they peripherally perfused? Um, or are they cold and you want to check their capillary refill, which should be less than two seconds if they're adequately perfused. You then for cardiovascular want to feel pulses. So in infants and small babies, um, people usually feel for the femoral pulse over the radial, um, but you can feel for both. And then you want to feel for radio radial delay and radio femoral delay. Um, and these are why you're feeling for radio radial and radio femoral delay because it's usually present in those three um, pathologies. So either subclavian artery stenosis, an aortic dissection or an aortic coarctation. So just knowing those is um, quite useful. It's just another question. Um, mm -hmm. Would you test the capillary refill time centrally or peripherally? Ideally both if you can remember. Um, so test it peripherally, and then when you move on to the chest, you want to chest, uh, test it centrally as well. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but I would personally do both if you can. Um, JVP, I'm not gonna spend too much time on just in the interest of time, but essentially it's an indirect measure of your central venous pressure. So which basically equates to the pressure in your right atrium. Um, I've got a picture coming up. In terms of small babies, you're just going to have to be quite opportunistic and as they're playing, try and look at their neck um, because they're not really going to sit still with their head 45 degrees to the left. Um, and in this picture, you can see where you look and how you measure. So I think people get quite confused in how you measure um, because they try and measure sort of flat up against the skin when you actually want to measure where this yellow line is. So directly up and across. Um, and it should be less than three centimetres. Um, but again, for babies, this is not something you're going to be able to test directly. And just being aware of things that might cause a raised JVP is useful in case asked in a clinical um, OSCE scenario. So most common things are right-sided heart failure, tricuspid regurgitation and constrictive pericarditis. Okay. So then you're onto your face. So I'll just go through this um, one, does anyone want to say what they can see in these eyes? Something that you look for in most examinations. Uh, the conjunctiva? Yeah, brilliant. So that's conjunctival pallor, which is um, a sign of um, iron deficiency anemia. And then these are the xanthelasma that I talked about um, linked to the xanthomata on the hand. So the cholesterol deposits. This is quite difficult, so I'll just go through this. So this is um, 
the buzzword is they're called Kaiser Fleischer rings and they're found in a condition called Wilson's disease, um, which some of you might know is when you have um, a defect in how you process copper. So you basically get copper accumulation in the body, um, in the organs, and this is how it looks when it's in the eye. So it's, it's useful as part of the cardiovascular examination as copper deposition in the heart can obviously cause lots of different problems. Um, and this is linking to the um, spider fingers we saw previously, if anyone wants to say what they think this is. Is it, is it caries? Um, the, so that was my next point, Stephen. So yeah, dental caries, this patient does also have, and you always want to look for those because it's a risk factor for infective endocarditis. Um, this is quite a tricky picture, but it's also it's trying to show a high arch palate. Um, so that's also associated, often seen in patients with Marfan's disease as well. So we'll just quickly go through this. So you, you do a general inspection of the face. Nasal flaring and grunting in a child or a baby is quite a useful sign of respiratory distress. Then you've got your eye signs that we've gone through and then your mouth signs um, that we've covered with the pictures. So you're moving on to your chest. Um, you want to start with inspection. So are there any obvious chest wall deformities or the scars present from previous surgeries? You then want to palpate. So there are three things to palpate for in a cardiovascular exam. The first is the apex beat, um, which in adults is found in the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line um, on the left-hand side. But just be aware in children under seven, it's actually found more in the fourth intercostal space um, in the midclavicular line, just because obviously as the child grows, it then sort of moves over into the fifth intercostal space. Um, so I think that's something that's quite useful to know as it's not often taught, well, I wasn't taught it when I was doing my peds placement. Um, and then you test for heaves and thrills, which are basically, I'll show you a picture because it will, so this is how you test for heaves. Um, so you place the, sort of heel of your hand parallel to the left sternal edge of the heart and you're basically just feeling for any sort of hard pulsations of the heart. Obviously in a little baby or a younger child you might be better off using two fingers as opposed to the whole heel of your hand and then thrills is basically just feeling for any palpable murmurs so with your fingers you feel over the four different regions um, of the valves so you I remember this with um, a mnemonic A place to meet. I don't know if that's helpful, but just to remember where the different valves are. And you literally just put your two fingers over the valves. And if they have a significant murmur with a thrill, you'll be able to feel almost like turbulent blood flow. So then you listen um, to all those four areas with your diaphragm and then you listen with your bell of the stethoscope. It's important to do both because they detect different sounds. So your diaphragm will detect the more um, high frequency murmurs like your sort of ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis, whereas the bell um, will detect lower frequency sounds um, like your mid diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. Um, and this is just for you to go back to in your own time. That's basically just the anatomical locations of the different valves. <clears throat> then you also want to listen to the lungs after you've listened to the heart. So ideally anteriorly and posteriorly. Um, and we'll go into that more in the respiratory exam. But you just want to listen evenly on each side and ask the child if they're capable to take a few deep breaths in and out. Um, and if they're not, then just try and get them as quiet as they can as you can even. Um, so these are some scars that, again, I'm not going to go into, but it's quite important to go over these in your own time, both for the cardio and the respiratory examination, just to be able to recognise um, key scars. And again, this is more for your personal um, revision. These are basically the key murmurs that you're likely to find in children, um, and how they present, so the key features. Just remember that over 50% of children, when you examine them, will have a murmur at some point. Um, and actually congenital heart disease with murmurs is only present in 1% of kids. So the majority of murmurs that you will hear will be innocent. 
um, obviously at the beginning when none of us are really confident listening to them, it's always useful to seek senior advice, but these are just a few um, signs that you guys can use um, to try and differentiate between an innocent and a pathological murmur. So the sensitive part is just that it usually changes with respiration or position of the child. <clears throat> and then it's usually short, they're quite soft and they're usually systolic. Um, so again, that's just for you to refer back to. And then lastly, you do your edema. Um, so usually just ask the parent if the child looks puffy or swollen, because if you're seeing the child for the first time, it can be quite difficult to um, tell yourself if you think they look puffy or swollen. Um, and then, yeah, so obviously depending on how mobile and active the child is, like if the child isn't mobile, then they're most likely going to have um, edema in their sort of gravity dependent places, like their feet in their sacrum. But if they are mobile, that might change depending on the age of the child. So that's just quite useful to consider. And then further investigations, just very quickly, are what you could suggest at the end. There we go. Okay. So do we have any questions on the cardiovascular examination? Uh, none on the cardiovascular exam. Okay. So what I think we might do is go on to go on to respiratory. So this is the summary slide again. So you've got your wiper, <clears throat> general inspection. Uh, start with the hands, move all the way up. So you need to look and do the pulses. Then you do your face, you've got your general inspection, eyes and mouth. Um, then I'll go into this in a bit more detail, but you want to feel for the trachea and any lymph nodes in the cervical region. Moving on to the chest and then ending with edema and your usual summary and further investigations. So general inspection is, as you'll work out, quite similar uh, between most examinations. So those are the key things you're looking for. Obviously shortness of breath and work of breathing is really important. And then any sounds you can hear from the end of the bed. So things like wheeze, <coughs> um, stride or, and anything else. And then you've got your syndromic features and your surrounding medical equipment. So can anyone, can be very, very basic, but just put in the chat or unmute yourself and just say kind of what your understanding of stride or is. Um, as a respiratory sound. Student is saying it's a uh, inspiratory problem. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so it is, and it's usually a, so it's an abnormal, um, as you've identified, respiratory, um, problem which is usually inspiratory because it's caused by a partial obstruction of your upper airway um another so, student is saying it's a high pitch sound yeah brilliant that's all really good so i'm going to try play this so you guys can hear let's see if it works what it sounds like <laughs> Okay, could you guys hear that? Okay, cool. Um, so then we won't do this as a question just in the interest of time, but when you ever you hear stridor, especially in a child, it's useful to think in your head of acute causes and more chronic causes. So acute causes might be something like um, croup, foreign body aspiration, something like that. So it's a sudden obstruction or partial obstruction. And then a patient that might have a chronic stride or might be something like um, laryngomalacia, which young babies have when basically their trachea is floppy and it doesn't stay open. Um, so it's quite useful to think of those when you're trying to work out what's going on. And then last bit of data and for the general inspection. This is a, say you found this on the bedside of a patient, what kind of condition would you be thinking of if you saw this? Because this might come up in clinical exams. Cystic fibrosis. Yeah, brilliant. So this is just um, pancreatic lip um, enzyme replacement. 
but we definitely had something similar in one of our exams and they asked us what what we thought it was for so then hands um, again i won't spend too much long time on this because it's similar to cardio the only other thing that's quite important is looking for a resting tremor because especially in kids with asthma who use salbutamol um, inhalers just get them to hold their hands out like this and watch for a tremor um, as that might be present if especially if they've recently used their inhaler then you've got clubbing your usual pulses um, these are some key respiratory causes for clubbing so different to your cardiovascular causes um, and I think you, most of you would have heard of all of those the only one that's a bit more um, different is primary ciliary dyskinesia which is basically when children have problems with the cilia the little beating hairs in their body um, and they usually present with chronic respiratory infections um, and it can infect fertility <clears throat> so then we go on to the face again you're looking for those signs of respiratory distress so your nasal flaring and grunting um, and micronathia is just quite useful for respiratory because it's basically an undersized um, jaw. So children with sleep apnea and other things um, can often have that on examination. Usual signs in the eyes and ears. Um, hearing aids can be associated with the primary ciliary dyskinesia that I just explained, um, as they often sometimes get hearing loss. And then nose, because you're thinking of how they're breathing, do they have a deviated nasal septum that's obvious or any polyps? Um, and then mouth, your usual, sorry, that should say cleft palate um, and central cyanosis. And then throat, you're looking for things like big tonsils or things that might obstruct um, breathing. So then you go on to your trachea and your lymph nodes, so you're moving towards the chest now. Can I just ask a good question? Yeah. In children, um, obviously it's quite normal for the adenoids sometimes to be quite quite large as well. Are there any kind of pointers or any specific points that you could possibly explain how to differentiate between adenoid hypertrophy and, and general kind of tonsillitis and tonsillar hypertrophy? Yeah, it's tricky because I think basically they say younger than seven, adenoids and tonsils are, they appear large, even though all they are is large in comparison to the the airway in which they're in, if that makes sense, because obviously their anatomy is a lot smaller. Um, so I think basically if, if it's affecting the child's life, i.e. they're having sleep apnea or they're having recurrent infections, particularly ear infections, um, then that would be probably labeled as um, adenoid plus or minus tonsillar hypertrophy. Um, I think if it's not sort of affecting their day-to-day -day life, then it probably will just be seen as more of a normal variant. Um, and obviously if you have an infection of the tonsils on top, then that will be tonsillitis rather than large you know, tonsillar hypertrophy. Thank you. That makes sense. Okay, so then you're feeling for your trachea. So all you literally do is just feel it, your trachea or the patient's trachea and feel if it's central. Um, again, difficult on moving children, so do what you can and then ideally you want to palpate their lymph nodes um, and this is just a diagram for you guys to refer back to for which sort of groups of lymph nodes you're palpating in the cervical area. So this we'll just do quickly so if we're thinking of the trachea and why we're feeling for whether it's central or not can anyone think of two pathologies that will cause the trachea to deviate away from the pathology? Um, one of the students is saying a tension pneumothorax. Yeah, brilliant. I'd like to chime in. Um, possibly croup, which causes kind of tugging away. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And then the other um, one is a pleural effusion. Obviously, it has to be quite large to move the trachea, but that, when it is large, pushes it away. And then two that might push, sort of pull it towards. Once again, pneumothorax. Yeah, so pneumothorax, pneumothoraces usually do um, push away. I mean, it, if they're small, they probably won't move the trachea much at all. Um, but the two main ones for towards is if you have a collapse of one of your um, lung lobes, 
or you have um, removal of one of your long lobes, so pneumonectomy or something like that. One of the students just had lung collapse actually, so yeah. Brilliant, well done guys, that's really good. Um, okay, <clears throat> so then you move on to your chest. So this is quite a difficult picture. I'll ask if anyone knows what I'm trying to get out here and if not, I'll just explain because I realize it's quite, quite hard. So the picture on the top right, can anyone say what they think they can see or what's going on? Is there intercostal recession? Brilliant, thank you, Stephen. That's exactly what I wanted you to say, cause, so Stephen's right, this looks very much like intercostal recessions, which is what you get when a child is having difficulty breathing. So you get in drawing between the ribs, but this in fact is actually sort of um, long-term in drawing due to a child with chronic asthma. Um, so this sign is called Harrison's sulci, which you may or may not have heard of before, um, but it's just quite interesting to know about because a child with long-term asthma that's been quite poorly controlled, they obviously have long-term sort of pulling on their diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. So eventually over time, they get this more permanent indrawing of the muscles between the ribs. Um, so that's just more of interest rather than learning. Um, so yeah, inspection, you're gonna look at their work of breathing. You want to do the respiratory rate. Just note the table on the side that obviously dependent on the child's age, respiratory rate and other observations like heart rate and blood pressure will change. The normal limits will change. Um, so just be aware of that. And then you've got your palpation. So feeling for the apex beat like you did in the cardio exam. And then you wanna feel for chest expansion. So again, on a sleeping baby, this is easy. On a moving toddler, it's not that easy, but essentially you want to just decipher, is it symmetrical or is it asymmetrical? And that is how you do it. So you put your hands round um, and then you ask them to take a deep breath in if they can or if they're cooperative. And then you should see your thumbs moving and they should be symmetrical if there's no um, pathologies. Just a quick question, Tish. Yeah. Um, so a student is asking, is Harrison's sulcus always as easy to see um, as it is on this picture? No, not always. Um, and I think it does often get confused with intercostal recessions. But if you see that appearance in a child who's had longstanding asthma, then you could be thinking of that. Interestingly, it also happens in children with rickets because they obviously don't get complete mineralization of their bones. So their bones are sort of more soft. Um, and in a child with rickets, even normal breathing can actually cause that indentation. Um, but it's most commonly found in poorly controlled asthmatics. Um, so the answer is no, it's not always that obvious, but think of it if you see in drawings in a long-term asthmatic patient. Um, but good question. Um, and then you want to do percussion. So this is the picture showing you percussion. So you're using your non-dominant hand on the chest and you're tapping it, your middle finger with your dominant hand's middle finger. And you ideally want to be going like this across the chest, um, <clears throat> comparing side to side um, and seeing the note that you hear. So if you hear a resonant note, and obviously it's hard to explain what that sounds like, you can only really know by just practicing on the wards, that's normal. If there's fluid in the lung, you'll often get a dull or a stony dull percussion note. And then if there's additional air, for example, a pneumothorax, you usually get a hyper-resonant note. Um, <clears throat> and I think on my reference slide, there's a link to something called the Lippmann Library, which I found really useful for listening to both heart and lung sounds. Um, I don't know if they do have percussion notes on there, but particularly breath sounds and added sounds, I really recommend having a look at it. Um, and on YouTube, they'll have um, videos of percussion notes. But ideally, examining a real patient is how you're going to learn best. And then like the end of the cardio exam, you want to auscultate their chest. So you want to comment on the breath sounds. Um, normal breath sounds are described as vesicular. And then any added sounds that you might hear such as um, wheeze or crackles if they've got an infection um, or something like that. So that's just where you listen. So it's important that you go across the chest in the same location. So you're comparing the same spot on both lungs. Um, and then never miss listening under the armpits as well. 
and then <clears throat> like the others you look at at the end of the examination you check for edema so you look at the sacrum the legs um, and you've already looked at the face and then lastly you've got your further investigations so for spiritually things like peak flow sputum sample if you think they've got an infection and then as always plotting their height and weight on a growth chart so do we have any questions for respiratory? Uh, we do not. So the last one we're gonna move on to is the abdominal examination. And I'll go through <clears throat> the beginning bit a bit quicker because as I said, it's the same for um, oh, most of the examinations. Okay, so you start with your wiper and your general inspection, like all the others. You then start with your hands and move up until you reach the face and then down onto the tummy. So I'll just put this up so everyone can have a little read and then I'll go through in detail um, each section. Um, but as I said, the, it's the same premise. So it's hands, face, neck, and then your main part of the examination, which is the tummy. <clears throat> so general inspection, you've got activity, level of alertness of the child. For the abdominal examination for gastro and hepatology, it's important to look for jaundice. Um, so this is the yellowing of the skin due to excess bilirubin. It's easiest to see it in the eyes, but if it's um, high enough, you can see it in the skin. <clears throat> and this is an example of a jaundice baby on the right. Um, then pallor, syndromic features, and your usual surrounding medical equipment or medications. So for gastro, you want to be thinking of things like um, NG tubes, stoma bags, if they've had a previous um, colectomy. And I think I've got a picture, yeah. So that's just a little baby with an NG tube. So these are all things that you would be expected to comment on during your general inspection. <clears throat> Okay, so a bit more data interp. This is the last one, guys. Uh, well, last examination. So what do people think they can see in these fingers? And what do people think they're linked to? Coilonchia. And a few students have also said coilonchia. Yeah, brilliant. And anyone want to say what they're assigned? Anemia. Yeah, brilliant. So that's iron deficiency anemia. So you get the kind of spooning of the nails. Um, and in, in a gastro exam, the main thing you're going to be thinking of is malabsorption, something like maybe Crohn's or celiac disease, if they've got an ongoing iron deficiency anemia. Anybody know what the, that mark is on the nail? Uh, someone is saying leukonchia. Yeah, brilliant. So that's whitening of the nail bed. It's usually due to having low albumin. Um, so you're thinking in terms of um, pathologies, things like protein losing enteropathies in gastro and also things like nephrotic syndrome um, can cause that as well. So well done, guys. So these are the kind of things you look for, along with your usual clubbing. Um, and then these are some gastro causes of clubbing, which is quite useful. So if you think basically anything that can cause, um, well, Clubbing is obviously due to the lack of oxygenation. So you're thinking cystic fibrosis, which comes into gastro due to its effect on the pancreas. And then all the malabsorption um, conditions will cause um, clubbing. And then you've also got your malignancies to think about. So then you feel for the pulse, as mentioned in younger babies, you use the femoral and in older babies, you use the radial. Then you move on to the face. So you're looking for your edema and your pallor. And then you look for similar signs. The only real addition is your um, jaundice that you're looking for in the white of the eyes. Um, does anyone know what this picture shows? Stomatitis. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. So that's angular stomatitis. So again, that's another sign of iron deficiency anemia. They've got the kind of cracking and erythema of the corners of the mouth. This one. Glossitis? Yeah, brilliant. It's um, 
sorry, the picture's actually not full, so it's a good spot. It's glossitis, which is basically just when you get a smooth, enlarged and red tongue, and it's common in folate B12 and iron deficiencies. So if you see that, you're thinking um, of a cause of malabsorption. This one. Students saying candidiasis. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so yeah, that's all candidiasis and you want to be thinking of immunosuppression, um, particularly in maybe transplant patients or thinking infections like HIV. And then last one, that's the inside of the mouth. Sorry, it's not very clear. Is that an ulcer? Yeah. Like an aphthous ulcer? Yeah. So that's an aphthous ulcer. Um, again, found in iron B12 and folate deficiency, but also, uh, sorry, also quite um, commonly linked to Crohn's disease um, in terms of malabsorption and the involvement of the GI tract from the mouth all the way down to the rectum. Um, so you've covered most all of those. Oh, I think that was, so those are just the things that you'd be looking for um, in the mouth. Then moving on to the neck. So you want to palpate again, the cervical lymph nodes that we went over last time. In particular of note, so your left supraclavicular node, it's also called, um, also known as Verkov's node. And that's very important to palpate for in the abdominal examination because it receives the lymphatic drainage from your abdominal cavity. So if there is like a metastatic intra-abdominal cancer, the first place it will spread is to your Verkov's node on the left side, supraclavicularly. Um, so that's important. And then on your right side, which is your right supraclavicular lymph node, which doesn't have a specific name, that receives lymphatic drainage from your thorax. So therefore, any malignancies, for example, like esophageal cancer, will go to your right supraclavicular node um, first. So left supraclavicular tummy, right supraclavicular supraclavicular thorax, any other organs in your thorax. Um, obviously, hopefully those types of malignancies are less common in children, um, but intra-abdominal um, malignancies such as neuroblastomas are actually things that you want to be ruling out in kids. And then, so abdomen, as always, you start with your look, then you feel, and then you usually listen. Um, so you're looking for scars, distension, any hernias, particularly umbilical hernias in babies, which are more common. Then drains, tumes, and any stomas if they've had um, previous surgery. You then want to palpate the stomach. So you palpate in the nine areas, which I'll show you on a picture shortly. You start with light palpation and then you go slightly deeper. It's important to look at the child's face because the child might not tell you if it's painful um, and you might miss something. You then want to palpate um, the spleen and the liver on either side and percuss both of those to feel for any organomegaly. And then lastly, you want to feel for the kidneys. Um, so these are the areas of the stomach that you're going to be feeling doing your light palpation followed by your deep. Then this is how you feel um, for the liver on the right hand side and you do the same for the spleen. So you're feeling with the edge of your index finger and asking the patient to take deep breaths in and out. The idea is that if there is any organomegaly of either the liver or the spleen, when they breathe in and those organs are pushed down, if they're big or enlarged, they sh you should be able to feel the edge on your edge of your index finger. Um, so just having a practice doing that on patients is useful. Um, and then this is how you feel the kidneys. So they call it bimanual balloting. Essentially, you want to have one hand behind the patient feeling the back of the kidneys and one at the front. Um, and you shouldn't be able to feel the kidneys, but obviously if, there's, if they're enlarged for some reason or there's a mass, um, then you, you might be able to feel it. For children, in terms of ruling out sort of dangerous pathologies like um, perforation and peritonitis you can do basic things like when the child's lying down ask them to raise a leg a straight leg because if they've got um, a peritonitic stomach they're not going to be able to lift up their leg without it causing them excruciating pain um, or they you know younger children ask them to blow out their tummy and then suck it in again they won't be able to do that if they're really quite unwell 
Um, so I'm not going to go over this. This is just for you to look at um, in your free time, but it's some masses that you might find in an abdominal examination in children. Uh, the most common one is actually fecal masses, which are usually on the left side. Um, they're obviously not tender and they can, if they're if the child's quite constipated, you can actually make an indent or feel like you're making an indent on your examination um, within the fecal mass. So that's just quite useful. Um, then you want to listen for the bowel sounds. So um, you've got, obviously, if you hear bowel sounds, they're present. Then tinkling bowel sounds are usually present in bowel obstruction. Um, and then absent bowel sounds is when you have um, ileus of the bowel, so i.e. the peristaltic um, mechanism isn't working, so the bowel's no longer contracting and moving. Um, in a child, and I'm not sure if it's the same for adults, but potentially you have to have absent bowel sound, you have to listen, sorry, for the bowel sounds for three minutes to be able to say whether they're absent or not. So obviously in a clinical exam, you're just going to listen for a short amount of time. Um, shifting dullness, I'm not going to go into, but only because it's not really used in children, except obviously if they're really unwell and they're presenting with ascites, so fluid in their stomach. Um, and I've just put it there just in case. I'm sure most of you know how to do it, how to test for it. But if not, it's something just to look up, um, particularly for adult examinations. Um, we won't go over this just in the interest of time, but for clinical exams, always have in the back of your head some key causes um, for splenomegaly, hepatomegaly and enlarged kidneys. Um, it's just something that is easy for them to ask and it's something that when you're examining you obviously need to have it in the back of your head because if you found that clinical finding then you need to be thinking why is that going on. So the main things for splenomegaly are things like infection, particularly EBV and malaria, um, hematological conditions are things like hemolytic anemia and sickle cell at the beginning obviously as sickle cell goes on you then get um, a shriveled up spleen and then malignancies so leukemia and lymphoma and then for hepatomegaly it's quite similar so that makes learning quite easy and then for your kidneys you need to differentiate between whether you've got one large kidney or whether you've got two so if you've got a unilateral kidney you want to be thinking things like hydronephrosis um, a cyst or a localized tumor and then if it's bilateral again you could have bilateral hydronephrosis depending on where the obstruction is kidney stones and obviously your polycystic kidneys so again this is just for you to refer back to as i said about the heart and the lungs and the chest you need to know common scars of the abdomen um, obviously hopefully children haven't you know always had lots of operations but some of them have um, and particularly things like an appendicectomy scar and that kind of thing, you need to be able to pick up on and describe in a clinical examination. Um, so I'll just touch on this lastly. So um, in children, as part of an abdominal examination, you usually do a genital examination with that. Um, so obviously in males, you're looking for things like obvious penile abnormalities, um, descended whether they've got descended or undescended testes and any obvious scrotal swellings as that can obviously be linked to abdominal pain um, especially things like torsion in slightly older children and then females um, you it's a more of a simple examination because you're basically trying to rule out um, an inflam a pelvic inflammatory disease which hopefully shouldn't be presenting in young children but the most obvious sign you'd look for is abnormal discharge um, and just to note that rectal examinations are not routinely performed in children. Um, I think I can't remember the level of specialty trainee that would do one, but it's very usually a very senior doctor that would ever perform a rectal examination on a child. So when you're suggesting your further investigations at the end, unlike an adult abdominal examination, a PR exam is probably not going to be on your list. So then just to finish off, you do your edema, particularly pedal edema, um, if you're thinking of liver disease in the abdominal examination. And then you finish off with your further investigations. So nutritional assessment is really key. And again, your height and weight on the growth chart when you're looking at things like malabsorption. Um, urinalysis, if you're suspecting an infection. And then obviously things like stool analysis, if you're um, thinking of something like gastroenteritis or fecal calprotectin, which is an inflammatory marker for um, inflammatory bowel disease. So that's just kind of how you'd, how you'd finish off your abdominal examination. 
So that is all the four examinations that I was going to go through today. Do we have any questions on the ABDO exam just before I do the summary bit? Uh, we are clear on YouTube and we're also clear in this chat. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I realise it's quite a whistle-stop tour um, and those four examinations are quite key systems um, in adults and paediatrics. But so these are kind of just the take home messages. Um, have a systematic approach. Obviously, um, everyone's systematic approach will be a bit different and that doesn't matter as long as you learn your own um, in a way that stops you um, forgetting key parts of the examination. Um, be prepared to have to adapt in children, as I've said, is very opportunistic. You're very unlikely to be able to do a full examination start to finish. Um, so watch them playing, do, small, do sort of variations of your normal examination to keep them happy, um, as trying to examine a screaming child is obviously harder um, than expected. And then remember changes as, the, as children grow. So things like their observations change, um, obviously the position of the apex beat in the heart slightly shifts. So things like that you just need to consider um, dependent on the age of the child. And then lastly, just learn the pathologies that are indicated by the clinical signs, because I think it's quite, especially in the earlier years of studying, it's very easy to get caught up in not forgetting the process and what you need to be measuring and looking at. But actually, as you get later on and your confidence builds, it's important to focus on the clinical pathologies that you're trying to rule in or rule out, because ultimately that is the point of the examination. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, these are my references and I would recommend, if you have time, looking at things like Spotting the Sick Child, Don't Forget the Bubbles and the Littman Library because they're really good in terms of assessing acutely unwell children. Um, and then the Littman Library is just examples of heart and lung sounds that you might hear on examination. Um, and obviously examining patients on the wards is the best practice that you'll get. Um, as and where that's possible. So thank you very much guys for listening this evening. And if anyone's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Perfect, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jervis from, from myself and uh, from, from the whole of UAMS as well. Um, thank you to the students for, for sticking um, for sticking with us and for giving their, their evening up. Um, Tish, is there any way you could possibly, yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, so just to uh, just to give you guys um, a heads up of what's coming um, in the future. So um, in a few days, we will have uh, the respiratory exam uh, performed by uh, Dr. Dev, who is a consultant uh, respiratory physician in the UK as well. Um, you might notice that there's no time um, specified on this slide, but I can confirm that that will uh, be happening um, at 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, so if you guys want to save that for your calendar, uh, that would be great. And then a few days after that, we will have um, another physician in the UK uh, talk to us about the cardiovascular exam as well. So uh, both of those topics are quite complex. So uh, hopefully many of you can tune in um, for those. And uh, yeah, hopefully they'll be really beneficial uh, for all of you. Uh, just a quick thank you to all of our sponsors once again um, at the bottom, uh, Podcases uh, by Scrubbed In. Os implants, my suture, um, Quesmed and uh, Medal and Anastomos. Uh, as you can see, um, the feedback link is, is quite uh, evident on this screen. So if you guys can fill this feedback form out, um, that'd be really good for, for everyone involved, for, for us to, to figure out how we can improve, um, for Dr. Jervis um, as well. Um, thank you once again, um, Tish, for, for giving up your time, for, for lecturing us. Um, it was really informative. I think um, everyone enjoyed it, myself included. Um, so yeah. And if there are any further questions, I'm just going. To... Yep. If there are any further questions, um, please let let us know on the Facebook event page. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us on on Instagram or Facebook. Um, or any of the board members as well, or committee members, and we'd be happy to help. Um, once again, thank you everyone for, for giving up your, your, your Wednesday evening. Um, thank you once again, Tish, um, for, for teaching us. Um, and yeah.
so so with that um i think i'll we, we can end this in this lecture now and hopefully we can see you all um uh, on the 12th of june for our respiratory exam so thank you all once again um and hope to see you at our next event thank you thank you bye